In recognition of April being National Poetry Month in the US, we're going to explore the world-building and historical elements of Mountain Blade Warband's romantic poetry. No, just kidding, that's super nerdy. We're going to talk about fictional in-game board games. Many games have games within them, from the often maligned hacking minigame to jobs becoming rhythm games to games played in-universe, these moments that break up gameplay are a staple of the medium. In this light, Bannerlord is not all that special. Tavern games like those in Bannerlord fall right into that latter category. But there is something that makes Bannerlord's games interesting, something we're going to wind into. There's plenty of reasons for fictions, in a broad sense, to include games in their world, from general world building to a diegetic minigame excuse to plain old immersion. This, of course, ranges beyond games into other mediums, like books, anything exploring an imagined space. Brave New World by Aldous Huxley has several unexplained impossible to play games, purely for the sake of world building. Centrifugal Bumble Puppy exists for a reason. Banner Lord is a good way to explore the use of games within games in particular, and some of the ups and downs both with bothering to do it and with what I'll call implementation difficulties. Many games have their own diegetic games within them, sometimes playable, like Gwent, and sometimes unplayable in the real world, like Gwent. But wait, doesn't Gwent have its own digital release standalone game where you play other people? Yes, and it does so by having almost nothing in common with Witcher 3 Gwent. Honestly, I could do a whole video discussing games and games like this and their viability in the real world and why some games just can't work, like Gwent, where against a real person the game would be fundamentally unfun, and thus the whole game only works within the bounds of the game world. A world where it's more of an item progress check than a skill game. Many in-game games can't be actionalized without a lot of tweaks because of this very problem. In retrospect, a lot of them are card games. That's all I'll say on that for now, but the point to draw from this is that Bannerlord's games are real-world playable, and it's probably because they're real-world games. And they're real-world in ways that are almost all removed from the culture that's playing the game in Bannerlord. Every board game in Bannerlord is from our world. When I say that, you might think I mean that they're inspired by games we know, transformations borrowing from checkers or something, but no, they're borrowed from games that span the entire globe in potentially centuries of time. And it's not exactly hard to find out what they are, because Tail Worlds kept the names. Keep that in mind, by the way. We've got the Asurai with Siga, the Empire with Tiblet, Batania with Bagchal, Vlandia with Muterere, the Cusate with Puluk, and Sturgia with Konane. Now, as for why Tail Worlds picked these games and how they assigned them, we can only guess. Oh, how I wish there was a dev diary that just explained their whole thought process and how they assigned these games, but, ah, uh, alas, no such thing exists as far as I could tell. However, I feel like I have a sense of what Tail Worlds was thinking from a mix of playing the games and some added context. So I've sort of inadvertently written myself into the situation of reviewing what are often centuries old board games from cultures I'm not immersed in. I'm not gonna go too deep in the real world side of these games if it isn't relevant, though it will be once or twice. Note that none of these assessments of these games are supposed to be an objective judgement of them. I say that because later on we'll be digging a little into mechanics rather than cultural impressions and one game in particular is what some people might call flawed. Looking at the names out of context, you might not think too hard about it, but Muterere isn't Western European, it's Maori. Poluk isn't Steppe, neither Turkic nor Mongolian, it's Kekchi Mayan. We'll go over the origins as we get to each game, but there's one more caveat. For the most part, I'm not trying to make grand conclusive statements here so much as laying out influences and inspirations and possibilities. For example, I personally think trying to extrapolate a faction playstyle from their respective game is unhelpful. It's easy to make claims like, ah, you see, with the SRI positioning is half the battle. But it feels a bit like a horoscope in that you have to get so vague as to be technically applicable to many factions. Let's play a round or two of each and talk them over, and since I just brought them up, let's start with the Asurai. The Asurai game is Siga, which is of Egyptian origin. Don't get used to the games lining up that neatly, this is the only one that shares an origin point with one of the cultures the faction represents. Unless I'm missing something. This is one of the three games that uses a checkered grid board, similar to chess, or checkers, which is probably a better comparison. In fact, checkers slash draught style games have, according to Phaedrus by Plato, been played in the Egyptian region since at least the classical era. 
The description in game is Siga is a traditional game within the SRI. It is a game of calm strategy. You start by placing your pieces on the board, crafting a trap for your enemies to fall into. Then you battle across the board, capturing and eliminating your opponents. Here's how the game works. Siga is played in two phases, one of placing pieces, the other of capturing pieces. From this, of course, comes a strategy of placement, as players take turns setting up their pieces two at a time. Constructing inevitable bad trades for an opponent is the point of the phase. It can be hard to learn, but I've also had fun with it just having vague rules for myself like controlling the center a bit, but leaving room for the opponent to have to start with a loss. This is also as good a point as any to make note that while these games weren't made by Tail Worlds, they did make conscious decisions regarding the rules. Sega is somewhat of a malleable game in reality. After all, board games are designed to be fun, and to that end, entire communities sometimes have house rules or rules of precision versus expediency, as in the case of Sega and where the game ends. Does the game end when the opponent has no pieces left, or merely has no chance? Must all the pieces be captured? Why bother? An opponent with one piece cannot capture pieces, they're effectively just running away from being encircled, delaying the end of the game. Now, as for the ways this blends with the faction, the Asurai are a skirmish-heavy faction, so you could say something for whittling the enemies down, picking them off, but that's the base premise of many abstract board games. And like real war, but also true for every faction, you are stronger with more pieces and favorable trades. Later games we discuss will mirror the map situation of their culture, but this is not one of them. While a compelling game, I can't say that it has some deep connection to the Asurai culture, not that I can see at least, aside from like vague allusions to shrewdness, but that can get weird, and most of these games require some thinking. Per the description, Siga is about constructing traps for the enemy, but forcing ideal terrain or baiting enemies isn't distinct to any one faction. One could argue this aligns a bit with the skirmish potential of baiting enemy infantry into a charge, but that's the most credit I can give. Tablet and the Empire aren't as geographically connected as the Asurai were to Siga. That's going to be a trend moving forward. It's the second most proximal of the pairs, and we're talking Byzanto-Romans playing a game from the Sami tradition? But there's a twist. The Tafel games, as they're broadly called, of which Tablet is the most well-documented, were thought to be of indirect Roman origin, at least according to a 1951 book about board games other than chess called A History of Board Games Other Than Chess. Great title, no notes. The description in-game is... Tablet is a game of incredibly uneven odds. A weakened and trapped king must try to escape from a horde of attackers who assault from every direction. Ironic how we, the once all-powerful empire, have now fallen in the same position. The descriptors won't ever be so on the nose as this again. That said, as forward as it is, there are some things to pick apart here. Before that, here's how the game goes. Tablet is our first asymmetrical game, where the sides have different objectives and setups. The white pieces are defensive, and they want to get the king to the edge of the board so he can escape. Captures usually take two pieces to accomplish. A piece has to be either flanked, or have an enemy on one side and the center square on the other. The games won't ever run so long that you capture all of an opponent's pieces unless something has gone very wrong. In turn, unsurprisingly, the black pieces want to capture the king the same way they would any piece, by flanking it. The Empire are a defensive-oriented faction in battles, and on the map, all three of the Empire culture factions are surrounded. In fact, the whole culture is surrounded except for places with natural borders protecting them like Vostrum. And speaking of Vostrum, it's here that we find an interesting encyclopedia entry that makes a small detail of the game feel… off. Accusations of being secret monarchists doesn't exactly paint the position of kingship in a favorable light, you know? The whole of the Southern Empire's description also adds to that distrust. I didn't go into the finer details of imperial dispute in the last video, but Rega's claim to the throne, on her daughter's behalf, is an affront to several imperial traditions, not just the default correct succession. Uh, where was I? Right, board games. In that light, having the centerpiece called a king and not an emperor is… odd? I can see why setting it up as protect the senator doesn't feel as impactful and how a general would be expected to fight not flee, but… Emperor is right there. Beyond that, I find Tablet to be fitting and interesting, but it's less culture, more map position. It's also one of the games I enjoy more. The asymmetrical gameplay is interesting, but it's a bit ironic given that it's the only culture that actually has routine fights within its own culture, against its own unit types, and thus probably the most symmetrical combat. The next game we're looking at is also asymmetrical, but all the more fitting for it. 
Bannerlord's Batanian Bag Chal, boy is that a phrase, is a game of sheep and wolves. As the second and final drastically asymmetrical game, in that the sides are more distinct than just turn order, Bag Chal is one that requires a bit more exploration. To give you a sense of how much further out of relevance these games are going to get, Bog Chal is the third closest to its point of origin, and we're talking a Celtic faction playing a game from Nepal. Also I won't be doing a ranking for the rest of them because they're all equal in impossible cultural exchange. The description in game is, a couple of powerful wolves against a flock of helpless sheep. Bag Chal is a game of uneven odds and seemingly all powerful adversaries, but through strategy and sacrifice even the sheep can dominate the wolves. The description is somewhat similar to Tablet, in fact you can tell these were probably written by the same person given the word choice. Despite the descriptive similarities, the games are very different. Bagchal is about, on the wolf side, capturing pieces, and on the sheep side, not being captured while forcing the wolves into positions where they cannot move. The sheep are gradually placed on the board, ideally in placements that don't leave them open to capture. It's very easy to visualize given sheep and how flocking works to protect herds from predators of similar physical sizes. Like Sega and Tablet, this is a game with abstract pieces in Bannerlord. In real life, there's a few ways to represent the goats and tigers. Hmm. Bagchal has had a fundamental change in its aesthetic that the other games hardly have room for. With Tablet, I suggested that King was an odd thing to keep around for an empire culture, but this is different. So why did they change it? And why did they keep the name? The aesthetic reasons for changing pieces are fairly obvious. Goats and tigers would stick out like a sore thumb for a Celtic faction to be playing with. Regarding the name, using names from an unfamiliar language is a trick for world building. Sometimes it's in the language the world is emulating and sometimes it's sufficient to be more or less just exotic as in the case of Assyrian names for caves in Morrowind. Unless of course the Dunmer are supposed to be Mesopotamian. Okay, maybe that was a bad example. The names might even come across as made up for the game, depending on the player's exposure to Nepalese or Sami, etc. There's also the issue that these games aren't substantively transformed. They're not inspired by the real world counterpart, they just are it. In turn, changing the name would be, I guess I'd call it culturally insensitive? Certainly appropriative in some manner, though I'm not sure it fits the common definition. In many cases, the Bannerlord games are obscure or are fading from cultural memory or relevance. Bagchal itself is staying alive in Nepal largely due to active conservation efforts. In what turned out to be an unfortunately common theme to the games in Bannerlord, making research a bit difficult, Bagchal has a barely documented origin with tons of gaps and few scholars writing on it. The main book I used for this was hardly comprehensive. I recognize this is tangential, but the use of these obscure games is sort of a win-win in that they get to be strange and new to many players while also sort of keeping the games alive. And while they can't be kept alive in their original context given the nature of the game world, keeping the names is a good decision. Okay, back to Batania. Wolves and sheep are an intentional choice beyond the aesthetic. More than a few times, Batanian notable figures ranging from companions to lords to Caladog himself use the metaphor of sheeps and flocks to describe the political situation of Batania. It is, in a sense, a recurring motif. Granted, sheep, wolves, flocks, those are common metaphors used in a lot of situations, but we don't really see other factions use this language. I'd say Bagchal is an inward-focused game in Batania, deriving its connection to the culture, playing it from internal politics, and of course, the real-world situation of being an actual shepherd and wolves being a nuisance and sheep being food for wolves. The Batanians are one of the factions that the Empire didn't conquer so much as suppress, and they did so by meddling with those internal politics and keeping clans divided, like with the Asari. The Batanians are also the only non-Empire faction that is physically surrounded. It's fitting in that sense. I don't think it plays much into their tactics though, as it's not like they're better with the square formation than anyone else or built for numerical advantage. Though maybe that was originally planned given half the units didn't used to have armor for flavor reasons. The allegory of sheep herding together to beat the circling wolves deepens a bit. The wolves aren't numerous enough on the board to surround the sheep, but they circle the herd given their starting position in the absolute margin. In light of all that, Bag Chal, while transformed a bit and indeed in ways that matter for the relevance of the game to Batanian culture, is one of the more fitting games. Now let's move on to one that's a bit less so. Vlandia's game Mutorere is Maori in origin. See what I mean about being further and further away from the 11th century old world inspirations? Per the description, Mutorere is a game of anticipation. With no possibility of capturing, all your effort should be on reading your opponent and planning further ahead than him. Uh-huh. 
Muturere is largely symmetrical. Of course, one player goes first, but aside from that, the goal is shared. Also, even if you're playing black, as in going second, you can get into a situation where going first doesn't matter in about two moves anyway. There's no jumping or capturing. The goal is to make sure your opponent has no more legal moves. There are most often only one or two legal moves to make in any given situation. Usually only one that doesn't result in a loss. You might have noticed something about the play of this game, and that's that it stalls out a lot. While some of the other games have times where the AI makes poor decisions, and they should or it wouldn't be fun, Muturere has a different issue. It can only be won if a player slips up. If you don't know what I mean, think of tic-tac-toe and how once you've grasped the game it's easy to force a draw every time and that winning isn't so much strategy as it is just waiting for an opponent to make a mistake. Granted, that framing could apply to a lot of games or be considered a strategy itself, but I think you know what I mean. It's called a solved game. A solved game is one where players can force an outcome, usually a draw. This tends to be a problem reserved for abstract games. Every game in Bannerlord is abstract, but not all of them have this issue. It's more common among games without an element of chance, like almost all of Bannerlord's games. Anyway, back to the board. Muturere lacks depth, truth be told. I get that's subjective, but once you learn the game is just don't group up into three adjacent pieces on the edge and do the same thing forever till the opponent makes a mistake, it ends up a game of waiting until someone stops paying attention. This becomes a bit of a bug versus feature question. I mean, there was an old bug where the AI would be reliably forced to lose in five moves because it responded the same way, but that's not what I mean, or I guess I do in a full circle way. What's the solution to the problem of AI in a solved game? It has to be programmed to just make the error eventually, or you're just stuck pressing the same button forever. So do you program the AI to lose less, but still sometimes to lose more? There's not many moves to be made. It's not complicated enough to really draw the other player into an unwinnable situation that's not mutually unwinnable for you. With the other games, they're drawn out enough that even against a computer, it feels like a game. Moving beyond the question of putting a game like this in a game at all, what does Muturere say about the Vlandians and their culture? Well, as we all know, the Vlandians are the only faction without a traditional archer, and crossbowmen underperform until the highest rank and have thematically correct shields that can't be functionally used. This is reminiscent of the way Muturere isn't very good. No, uh, honestly, let's go back to the description the game provides. There's an emphasis on reading the opponent, but there's, well, First off, no way to read the fake pixel man at the digital tavern table, and second, not a lot to read into, aside from if your friend across the table is tired of playing. There's no room for stuff like a fake out. In the end, the game is just one of testing patience, but bear with me here for a second. Maybe this does actually relate to crossbows. Okay, so crossbow quivers have far less ammunition, for whatever reason, and the crossbow men have shields, so they only have one ammo stack. The low ammo count compared to other ranged units means it's viable to simply wait out their volleys. There's also something to be said about the distinction between Vlandian and Empire cavalry charges and counter charges and what works best, but a lot of that also gets undercut by how easy it is to swap your position as black to being identical to having started as white. Something really curious I found in looking into Muturere was its disputed origin and the speculation that it wasn't actually a widespread pre-colonial game, but a game in a small community, not mass-adopted, or in some argument, not fully tested. So calling it a traditional Maori game might be correct, and it might have been as recognized and ubiquitous as checkers. Or it could have been about as niche and obscure as a Fallout Equestria homebrew tabletop game. Speaking of ponies, the Kuzate play a game called Puluk, which is Mayan in origin. The original game is, once again, only partly documented, and in this case we're not really sure if it's pre-colonial or post, and I don't know enough about the cultures to hazard a guess. That question of pre or post is, however, relevant for where this all goes. The description in-game is, Paluk is as fast and harsh as warfare should be. Capture as much as possible to keep your opponent weakened and demoralized. But behind this endless offense, there should always be a strong defense to punish any attempts from your opponent to regain control. Puluk is a game of going deeper into the board, capturing pieces, and returning home with the pieces. It's kind of like backgammon mixed with checkers in a way. Incidentally, backgammon might just be from the Middle English of back game, because you go back. Movement is determined by a dice roll, or in this case you toss sticks that are colored on one side, but for those who didn't know, that's still a die. 
Just as there are dice with more than six sides, there are also those with two. Basically one movement point for every colored side die. It makes sense to me. I mean, have you seen the abominations people come up with trying to make a five-sided die? I will note here that, contrary to the description, Poluk does not play fast due to all the rolling. The game is our first and only one in Bannerlord with a clear chance element. As for what the game says, there are a few things of note. Poluk actually inspired me to do this in the first place because of how well it felt like it fit. I was fascinated by how it really felt like a game that represented a raider, scout, horse-centric culture. I thought it was really interesting that a game mirrored a going out and returning with the spoils image of a raiding step culture. Granted, the Kurgit are no longer nomadic, but in a sense maybe that's actually more in line with having the stationary home spot to return to. But I'm sure many people have put together the issue. The Maya are nearly the furthest removed from a nomadic steppe culture one could be. They didn't have horses before European contact, and by then their polities had been largely disintegrated. So the game clearly has nothing to do with any of the ways I envisioned or connected it before realizing it was a real-world game from a culture very different and removed from the Kuzate. That said, I think it, like Batania with its tweak, was a good cultural pairing. There's not a lot to emphasize beyond the very clear connection of movement and capture, though. It's not like the Kuzate have a dice roll mechanic in combat. One final note on Poluk is that it's one of those games that has a fair few minor variations house rules, etc. The rule changes I've seen have almost always been centered on the number of pieces one can have out of the home space at a time. I note this here simply to evidence that Tail Worlds made a conscious choice when they allowed for all the pieces to be in play at once. Okay, one more game to go, and it's one I've heard people have a hard time with, and not for Vlandia reasons. Sturgia's game Konane is Hawaiian in origin. The book I used for the sake of an outside source states that Captain Cook claimed it was very much like our game of draught, but more intricate. That same section also remarks that the board game can be of varying sizes, so again, Tail Worlds made a choice with the rules. The description in game is, War is all about sacrifice. In Konane, you must make sure that your opponent sacrifices more than you do. Every move can expose you or your opponent and must be carefully considered." So that's a bit vague, but gameplay adds context. Konane is once again a game of locking down your opponent. You win when they have no legal moves. This time you can jump pieces and in doing so, capture them. This is not a game where strength comes from strictly more pieces and favorable trades in the traditional sense. With a bit of a reframe, one has to reconsider what they're trading for. It's not numbers, it's positioning. From the description, there's some obvious parallels to draw to the Sturgeon faction, but then again, are they unique to Sturgia? Like the problem all the way back at the Asteride, the idea of good positioning and favorable trades is equally important to everyone. It's not like Konane gives us the ethos behind Drizhnik shock troop tactics and their capacity as dismounted units or something. That said, I do think this game does fit Sturgia better than it might some other factions given their slower moving and defensive capacity as opposed to, say, the Kuzate. And I will concede that Sturgia with proper formations and positioning can wreak havoc on cavalry-centered armies like Valandia and the Kuzate, so maybe there's something to it there. As a final remark that touches on the whole of these games, I want to note that it's not as if we lack culturally appropriate games to connect to in-game cultures. Tablet, being Sami by way of Norse contact with the Roman games played by the Byzantines, should paint that picture fairly well. The Games Other Than Chess book I've been referencing has entire sections for Celtic games, medieval games, Central Asian games. We do have the information needed if Tale Worlds wanted to make games culturally grounded via the real world. In that light, these games were chosen and consciously assigned with some purpose, even if it's not the strongest connection or the clearest one or even if this all sounds like reading too deep into it. In the end, there's a question about all this speculating I've done. Do the games actually stand for cultural facets of the societies that play them? Does it say something about the Vlandians that Muterere is solved? Does it say something about the Kuzate that their game feels very connected to a horse lord raider culture type deal, but then the game is actually originally from the other side of the world and has nothing to do with horses or the steppe? If Vlandia got checkers, we might see it as a too obvious or not otherworldly choice. World building functionally relies to some extent on an inherent exoticism. Too much familiarity and the world doesn't feel distinct so much as borrowed. But where does that put Siga? I don't think it's a bad choice or a bad game, far from it. 
is it lazy to have the North African Mideast faction play a real-world North African game? What's the concern there? As previously discussed, they already kinda coded the countries to appropriate biomes. Familiarity isn't wholly thrown out. There's a balance. Interestingly, the book I used as a source has an entry for every game in Bannerlord. Some are longer than others. Mancala and Mancala likes, of which none appear in Bannerlord, get 100 pages alone while something like Mutarere gets a diagram and Bogchal gets only a sentence. Some get two entries, which is a bit confusing of a way to do things, and the index doesn't use page numbers, so thanks for that. Also interestingly, I stumbled upon a definition for an English board game called Leapfrog, where the author describes the game and then states, a more interesting game of this type was invented by me back in 1898. It just struck me as a funny thing to include in what is erstwhile an encyclopedic account of world-spanning board game history. But hey, if you play Leapfrog and you want to know how to jazz it up, I can tell you where to find some improvements. Ultimately, the games don't lose anything from being culturally ungrounded to the real world just as much as they don't gain a lot from being grounded. The games are at their best as a world building element when they mesh with the culture of playing them, and that's often best reflected in comparative battle tactics or geopolitical situations. As to how much they do that effectively and how intentional it all is, and indeed what the intent even is, I can't be definitive nor absolute. I'm sure there's many conclusions and understandings I've missed. It may not even be as deep as all this, but I simply cannot imagine they slapped it all together at random. The difficulty of making deep cultural connections always comes back to how the cultures and lore simply are not and indeed cannot be as deep as the real world. They can only invoke it. Hi. This one was supposed to be short, but I guess there's a lot to say when going over six factions and touching on real world cultures. At least it didn't end up longer than the other one, somehow. I hope nobody clicked on this expecting a guide to these games. If I ever made one, it wouldn't be a how-to-win-epic-style guide so much as this is how the game goes, and maybe a tip or two. That said, I'm not a master. I don't even know how I got the one win I did in Muterere. The last video was on Bannerlord 2, and it did pretty well, but if you're here for more Mountain Blade content, sorry to disappoint. This isn't a Mountain Blade channel, and I have no expectation of becoming one. It might still be worth subscribing, though. Who can say? Thank you to everyone who gave me money. Special thanks goes to Chandler Mason, Defender, Freddy, Galactic Beyond, Mark Soto, Nick, and Night Sugar. I might actually do something for Poetry Month, just to obliterate my momentum, you know? Viewer reduction strats. No promises, I don't make those anymore. My new thing is vaguely menacing sound clips. Bye. Want to feel my muscle?